We want to start off with a reminder that we are not doctors. Before you make any changes or try something new, always consult with your doctor and medical team first. Chronic illness can vary from patient to patient, so it's always best to consult with your own doctor for what is best for you. Hello, welcome to my IBD Determined. I'm your host, Mason Harvey, and I have Crohn's disease, and I speak from the role of a patient. <laughs> and I'm Michelle Harvey. I'm Mason's mom, and I speak from the role of a caregiver. So, which all of you are probably very familiar with at yes. this point. If you have so, watched the show from the first episode, there's a good chance you know what we're going to say in the beginning. Yeah, and you deserve a very special yes. award for you doing that. You stuck around this long. Yeah. yeah. In the comments, were you here for the first video? Yeah. For an original? We're like, yeah. actually, so we're season two, episode five, but it's actually like the 30th episode wow. that we have filmed. So 30 consecutive weeks. Woo-hoo! of talking That's about a- IBD that and is- we have plenty more to talk about yeah now. we do <laughs> that deserves a reward though yeah, yeah it is it's it's it hasn't been too bad yeah. so it's and today's fun. today's topic is diet kind of, it's diet um thank you fun. for just jumping into that <laughs> but I was gonna say <laughs> it's one that kind of been hesitant to talk about because I know it's such a sensitive topic and it's people who are totally pro diet other people are kind of there's a lot of controversy between yeah let's just say that there really is and so i don't want to have this this podcast be anything that offends anyone who's on either side of this but i think it's something that's important to discuss because yes and the reason i think it's important is i had talked within the group i'd asked people what are some of the most like worst things people have said the most annoying things people say to you and the overwhelming response was diet And we have here, we're not going to read all of them, but we have like two or three pages of individuals that have just one sentence of things that have been said to them about diet and IBD. A lot of people left a comment. (laughs) We can't read through all of them. No, we're not going to get to all of them. Yeah. We'll read a few. We will. And what that tells me is there's a lot of people that hear this all the time. And so there must be a lot of information out there that does suggest that diet can control IBD. And that could have something to do with also the confusion with IBS, I think. There could be something in there, too. And uh, there's, we'll go and put it up, but you're welcome to watch our IBS is not IBD episode. (laughs) So you can learn all about why that is not the same thing. Some people claim that they can put themselves into remission solely with diet. And others change their diet and there are no effects. They do not benefit from it. And so I think that's actually interesting in itself is how could someone with the same disease yeah. have such polar opposite Response. responses? Like we've said uh, Crohn's is different for everyone, but mm-hmm. to have your um, disease controlled by eating something and then someone has to be on a ton of different pills or uh, yeah, and medications and, and mm-hmm. shots and infusions to right. help control their disease. And And surgeries, seeing how uh, that can vary so much. And looking this up, I from the university hospitals, they state that IBD is not caused, nor can it be cured by what you eat. So I think this is really important. I'm about to read because people out there who are like, no, it can, it can. Like, hold on, let me finish. They say doctors and dietitians agree, however, that food may play some role in the underlying inflammatory process that causes IBD symptoms. So certain foods may aggravate symptoms while others may calm them and promote healing. Is in that um, little paragraph, whatever you want to call it, mm-hmm. uh, like, like she read, it doesn't say that food can cure it. It can lead to a flare potentially, but you can't cause Crohn's or you can't cure Crohn's with food. Right. So it may aggravate or help symptoms, yeah. basically symptoms, which is not the it's actual not Crohn's. Crohn's disease. It's the symptoms produced by the basically, disease. Basically, it's just putting a Band-Aid over the right. actual right. problem. It's not solving it, but it could help. So I think that's what's important for people to understand is that difference that diet is not going to cause it, it's not going to cure it, but it may help some of your symptoms. And so I think that's where some of the confusion lies is some people think that if they're on, and and we'll go into this in another episode, I'm not going to go into it here, but there are a bunch of different diets for IBD, a bunch of different suggestions. I mean, you've heard a lot of them too. When we're in the hospital, I heard a lot of different diets. But none of them were suggested 
alone. It was suggested in tandem with, with biologics. biologics. So that's what's From important. Indigenous. Yeah. This was not something where it's like just this alone. It was given as like an extra option. But we'll get into that in another episode because there's too many to go over here. And that's kind of not our focus. Stay tuned for so, the potential yes. next episode. <laughs> before we go further, uh, I think it's important to say, because even we're basically an online source where we're someone you guys listen to. But I think the most important resource you could use and trust is your own doctor. So it's important to know, like, we don't have the answers. There's a lot of sources online that will give you the answers you're looking for. So if you want to find something that says diet will solve it, you'll find it. And if you want something that says it will not, you'll find it. There's, there's um, responses to both sides, yes. depending on what you want to find, because they want you to visit your site. And if they tell you the information that you want to hear, you're yes. most likely going to visit that site over a site. And maybe that... buy whatever they're selling. Yeah. And if you feel like your doctor is not giving you the correct information, get a second opinion. Like, but before you just listen to some doctor off the internet and instead of your own, have that conversation with your doctor and maybe look at there's a deeper problem here if you don't have that trust and don't think your doctor is doing right for you. So make sure you know your options too and advocate for yourself. That's very important. These were the these are the comments that kind of sparked this whole podcast and we just go, wow, okay. I'll read the so, first one. Yeah. The first one on uh this long list is if you just <laughs> change your diet, dot dot dot. Yeah. So. And someone else said, My mother had Crohn's, she healed it with diet and never had it again. And that, these, these are not Crohn's. This is what, just to be clear, this is what Crohn's patients are being told. Mm -hmm. So like if they say, Yeah. I have Crohn's disease. These are the responses they're getting. So this isn't a Crohn's patient saying this themselves. This is the responses they're getting. So it's that's important. important to know. Yeah. Um, another one says they got blamed saying, oh, his diet is the cause. So putting the blame on to what he's eating, what he's eating, not the no. disease. We're born with the disease. Well, at least we think we still don't know what causes Crohn's. Exactly. It well, could be a, something that has to do genetically with DNA when you're born right. or something like that. Because there's a whole argument about it, about it being if it was just caused by what we eat um, or environment, it would be interesting why some people are 40 years old when they get this. Some people are 30. Some people are 70. And some people are 11. Are 11 some people are two. Anyways, yeah. just something to something to think about. So um, another one said, oh, I have celiac too. Cutting gluten is hard, but she'll feel so much better. That was advice given to a parent to give for their child. Um, celiac is not the same thing as Crohn's disease. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yes, it's not the same as IBD. Celiac right. is not the same as IBD. Right. It's important They're to know. They're all different. You can have IBD and be celiac. Yeah. You can have IBD and have IBS, but not the same thing. Not so, the same thing. Right. There's so, a reason they have different names. Right. Different things, different causes. So so anyways, that's not helpful. Um, read this next one. All right. Have you tried going gluten-free? And there's side-eye emojis. Yeah. they. I like those. Yeah. They added the, they added the, <laughs> the side-eye emojis. And gluten-free is something that's always suggested. But it's not a cure. No, and, and it doesn't potential will work, but it... other people may may have good results by cutting out gluten. But it's important to remember not everybody will. There's no one size fits everyone. all diet. There's nothing. Yeah, there's no cure all that one person has figured out. One set of friends said she used to have IBD in college and eating changed her and she's fine now. I don't think that was IBD. I don't think it could be <laughs> IBD. <laughs> And, and it minimizes the disease so much when people do this. Like this frustrates me because I feel like they act like it's just a food disease. Like, oh, okay, that's it, all it is. I mean, there might be a chance that might work on a few mm -hmm. select people. But if if that was really the case and you could cure IBD with food, wouldn't that be such a, um, it was like a, be a, miracle. a, a miracle. So another one, um, oh, you had a flare up. What did you eat? So again, blaming that Food. sometimes you have different triggers. Sometimes you don't realize something's a trigger till you try it. And then you're like, oh, that didn't agree with me. This next one is a pretty big one. One is the worst is to me is when people tell me just to change my diet and that I don't need my meds. So that's that's great coming from yeah. someone who doesn't have IBD, isn't a doctor, yeah. but they can just tell you to just do all that. And someone who their lives depend on these medications yeah. that they have to take every day or every week or every month. Right. I don't think they like hearing that. Right. So there's many more. Uh, I was told it could be cured by diet. Uh, I've been told this by many family members. I just need to eat differently. I'll pick 
one that I want to read next. It's not okay. the next one, but it's one that I Go ahead. want to keep. I once received a three three day long lecture from a family member over a hall over a holiday about how going keto would fix it. Yeah, they think that it's like a food thing, and it's like ah, my gosh. Nah. So. So we're going to go now to discuss like our thoughts on diet. And again, these are just our thoughts based on our experience. I want to be very clear because I want to be fair to anybody listening. I know you may have a different experience and that's what is really important to remember. I want you to realize if you are listening and don't have this experience like Mason does to recognize that there are differences. So between every person who has. Yeah. So I think that's important to look at too, not just to say, oh, they're wrong or oh, they're right. It's important to acknowledge that this is can be very individual how this is handled because there's a few different ways to look at it. If you're using diet solely for remission, like that's your only thing you're doing is changing your diet, that's one thing. Then there's people that use like diet with treatments, kind of what we're talking about, like when they, like when you did um, TPN and you are fed through the pick line and then you did your the, yeah. the supplemental drinks only, and then there was- but you were also on infliximab, Remicade at the time. Yeah. So it wasn't alone. It was, no, it was coupled morphine, and with steroids and with methotrexate at the same time. And then there's using biologics with no dietary changes, it which is basically like, where you're at. Yeah. So just on biologics, I'm not really doing yeah. anything different uh, with my diet. So I'm able to eat what I like and uh, just kind of fix it with um, which is which is lucky because Mason would suffer from you know he could be malnourished even though he was eating his body wasn't processing things correctly because those biologics it's now processing the food in the correct way and his body is much healthier and he's also hungrier so he has an appetite is in 2020 i would i mean i'd eat but because i was in flares a lot uh, yeah to the hospital and in the hospital i wasn't really that hungry but now i'm hungry because we got that flare under control and yeah so because like i guess what we're saying too is like if he didn't get that under control like he was saying he wasn't hungry Mm -hmm. so just doing dietary changes he would have been no appetite he would it would have been really hard to encourage him and to eat things that were restrictive like you know if you're on a certain diet you can only eat this right now and this and if he was already not hungry could you imagine being told like oh you you can't have that yeah but you could have this which doesn't sound good right at all (laughs) so there's that whole situation too which i know some parents listening you can relate to i also think the other thing with diet is people just wish it was that simple Right. Like how easy would that be if you didn't have to do all the biologics? You didn't have to pay for it. You didn't have to fight insurance. You didn't have to go to the hospital you and stop eating bread. And yeah, boom, you're good. And it was like your body is healed. I think that obviously there's a little bit more than that. But right. And I mean, yeah, it's not like we're saying sarcastically, but that's kind of like an example of like we wish it, it was, was like that. that simple. And if it is that simple for you, I just I cannot see how it's the same disease or or it's or maybe it's the same disease but maybe it it operates differently in you i think that a lot of times people are also scared of biologics and it it is a scary thing afraid of a needle no and it, it's and it's so i think like from the so again that's actually a good point from a patient from a child or teen the fear is probably of the infusion of the injection of right like that process so when i when i first went to the hospital i was like oh because uh, they um they were giving me an IV and I was like oh I don't want to do this this is horrible I'd rather mm-hmm. do anything else than get this IV but I after getting it for like three years I'm used to it now but when I yeah. was first getting it, I'm like oh I don't want that at all I don't want to get an IV I I was afraid of shots I don't want to get a shot and I do def- I definitely don't want to get an IV because yeah. it stays there and I think from a caregiver like a parent perspective our fear was more of what are we putting into our kids' bodies Mm -hmm. here? Like, I'm looking at this. This is crazy stuff. I've never heard of Remicade. What is Remicade? Yeah. So you would... You're using it on (laughs) Remicade? You Google it, you look it up, and you're like, oh my gosh. So it, it is very scary. And even as an adult... Um, it's it would be a daunting thing. And so I, I just think it's important to discuss with your doctor and ask the questions and find out, is it more of a risk to have an uncontrolled disease than the biologic? You know, what what are we what are you more afraid of, I guess? And for us, clearly, we didn't want an uncontrolled disease because that only leads in one direction and it's not a good one. So you want to do whatever you can to To make the body healthy control. 
And so the other thing, like, I think a lot of people think that biologics is big or biologics are big business and there's a lot of money to be made, which there is. Um, that it is, uh, it's, it, that we've, like we've said before, we're very open about it. It's like $28,000 for an injection from Stellara and those for him are every four weeks. And then for like the Intivio infusion with the hospital stay and the way they administer it as like a chemo, it's like 34000 a treatment. So it's an interesting it, idea. If it was all big business, it was just money mm-hmm. and they didn't do anything. Why would some biologics not work and then some would? Right. It's not like, yeah, it's not like they're all making the same product and just trying to sell it yeah. to you and raise the price or it's they're very different. That's the other thing. When we have a biologics episode, we can post that up at the top of the screen for you guys. But we have discussed this whole thing on how biologics work and they're very different. So but there's always a race to probably find the next treatment because there is such money in it. So we do understand that. And at the same time, though, I think that the diet industry is also big business. I think a lot of people are willing to spend money on supplements and order them from an online doctor that maybe is a really good spokesperson and really sells something. And I, you know, that it doesn't mean that they're not going to work for you. Uh, Again, everyone is different with this and people find their own way, but it is. Your business is still. They're trying to make money. It's still just, it's still trying to make money. So if you put the two next to each other, there's still profit to be made. That's something you know. to remember is even though these injections or other things are so expensive, nothing is as priceless as the gift of life. Yeah. So even if you're paying $25,000, is it, is that, it's worth it yeah. that you get to enjoy your life and have a good life. Right. And I think that's a great another podcast to talk about. <laughs> the best part is <laughs> you don't. Another... You only have to pay a fraction of that. Well, we do because we yeah. have insurance. Maybe let us know if you think that'd be interesting in a podcast, like advice, because we know um, we have different programs to help assist and pay for these. So yeah, what are some different programs? Yeah, so if that's something, maybe that's you know, let us know. And otherwise, I think that'd be an interesting podcast yeah. too to kind of help everybody. We got two new podcast ideas. Yeah, this we episode. do. We'll, we'll have to just rewatch so we don't forget because yes. I'm not taking notes. So <laughs> I think it's important, like we said, that there are triggers and that can help you, but they're not necessarily going to cure Crohn's. And so maybe you did find a diet. Maybe you did find a supplement that helps you not helps those triggers and helps you not flare, which is great. But it's just important to remember, even with biologics, neither of these things, or neither is curing the disease. Whether you're paying for a 25,000 shot or you're paying or you're just kind of excluding um, a certain type of food out of your diet, it's not curing it. It's just right. a Band-Aid that is being put over the disease. Right. It's not going to cure it, but it's going to make you feel better. Right. And I think there's several Band-Aids. So that's why I think there's a combinations of things that work. And I think that, you know, uh, until we actually get to the root cause of it and they can find a treatment or, or a cure even better for this. And I think the other thing that is frustrating when people discuss diet is it's really important to be careful when you tell someone to change their treatment to your own. I think it's important like to share your experience, kind of like what we do, but also realize that ultimately you need to find a treatment that will work for you. Like just because it's different for everyone. Like Mason's on Stellara and yeah. Intivio. Maybe Stellara doesn't work for you. Maybe right. Remicade works for you. Remicade didn't work for me, but right. it might work for you. Right. I would never say, oh, get off those. Only thing that's gonna work is if you get on two biologics yeah. and it's Stellara and Intivio. And I might now if people ask, I would say, well, this is what worked for Mason. And maybe I'm going to say, oh, make sure you get on this because these are the only two right. that work. Because we have one of a, his friends is on Remicade and that has worked for her since the day she was diagnosed. And that has been her go to. But if we just based Mason on her, he'd be very ill right now. <laughs> so it, so that's just why it's it's important to remember that your answer may not be somebody else's. It's good to maybe discuss and say, hey, this is what worked for me, but to not just think there is one answer. Yeah. And science is always changing. And so keep talking to your doctors, keep researching and find out how things are changing. And in re- in the reality of it all too, diet does play a role 
but in all aspects of life, not just someone with IBD. I think it can be argued, you know, even without it, diet is important. Having a healthy, balanced diet is important. And so there is something to that. Obviously, a body is healthier when you are treating it healthier with what you're feeding it. And some people, even without IBD, a regular person might get heartburn from eating something. Another person may get a stomach upset from eating something else. And and you know it. Like yeah. you're you can't like, eat pizza for five days straight. It's the only thing you eat. You gotta yeah. have pizza one for lunch. Then you gotta have something different for dinner. Then you have something different the next day. It can't be all the same. Right. It does make sense how with IBD, just like a normal person without IBD, it would have triggers too. And so it's just important to identify those triggers and just remember that diet affects everybody. So it does matter. Diet does play a role, I think, in IBD because it plays a role in anybody's lives. I think that's that's important to remember. But I think it's just upsetting when there's the assumption that diet is the only thing that affects IBD. And you, I think it just puts too much blame on the person. Like you like could fix it for what they're eating. Right. Like, why aren't you fixing it? Why don't you just do this? And it's like, you don't know. Maybe this person has tried. Maybe they have. And it isn't fair to blame the person. And it's it's the disease. And unless somebody has a known trigger and they purposely eat that trigger food that makes them sick. And I think, honestly, that's different if it's something like that. But for the most part, most people with IBD know their triggers and they are not going to purposely eat something. They do they not want, want that pain. Like that. No, it's painful. It's bad. Like they're not going to want to risk that. So I think more times when you're acting like somebody doesn't know, it feels like, okay, you know, we're most people would not do that with this disease. And And if you don't have the disease, it's like, well, do you know what you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Because I'm the one with the disease and I should know my disease better than someone who doesn't have this disease. Yeah. Yeah. And another, I I pulled another article and there's a Dr. James Lewis. It was from an article in gastroenterology and hepatology. And I think he put it, I I took this, what he said, because this is something that I really, um, I think is important to hear from. And he said, this was when he was asked if dietary modification alone can induce and retain IBD remission. So just a diet, not anything else. And he says there are some patients who are adequately managed with one medication, while others require multiple medications, which is true. Um, In the future, there will likely be a subpopulation of patients with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis whose inflammation can be controlled with a therapeutic diet. For other patients, dietary manipulation may be made through therapy that can allow them to use less immunosuppression and still remain in remission. And then finally, as with all medical therapies, there will almost certainly be a subset of the population in which dietary therapy is completely ineffective. But that's kind of what we've always thought is that you get this diagnosis, but is there different subpopulations within that? Is there different subsets of Crohn's disease where certain people can change Really, when they say I can just change my diet and it works because someone like you, that is not going to work. And why does one person need one biologic every eight weeks and someone like you needs needs two two every every four four weeks? weeks. And so it really just does seem like this disease needs to be attacked with how it's personally attacking the person. They need to figure out why it is doing that. Why is it different for everyone? Yeah. So I just found that really interesting because it really does vary. And that's why it's not good to give one size fits all answers to this disease. When somebody says, I have Crohn's, don't tell them, yeah, you can just cure it. You, no. Well, that worked for you. Didn't work for me. Right. Important to remember. We did have a dietitian for Mason who was an IBD dietitian and she did give us guidance. So we did have certain flare diets, things we tried when Mason was in a flare, but that was under guidance. That wasn't me going online asking another parent what they give their child and me doing that. That would not be safe. So it is very important to remember, like if you're an adult, you can make your own decisions. But when you're caregiving for a child, it is very important to work side by side with With the the doctor. doctor. Be very careful giving dietary advice to other parents. And if you are an adult, yeah, you can make your own decisions. But I would recommend even if you just want to go diet alone, continue to get lab draws, continue to check in with your doctor, sure continue to get okay. colonoscopies, right, yeah. like Mason said, to make sure everything's okay. Because if just one thing goes out of control, that could <laughs> throw you into an entire uh, train wreck or yeah. fire. 
Right. It's important no matter what you decide to be monitored by a doctor and continue to do those lab draws and continue to do your colonoscopies and endoscopies and things like that, MRIs and all that. So with this disease, it can turn on you very quickly. And so our final thoughts here, don't put others down for their choices uh, if, you know, on either side. I think if it's a safety issue and you feel you need to say something, that's one thing. But otherwise, if it's not hurting anybody and if somebody like don't say don't if be it's rude. dangerous for that person, give them a warning. But if if it's not your problem and they're not complaining about anything, right. you don't need to complain back. Right. It's Especially if you don't know enough about it. Especially yeah. if you're sharing a story that you heard down the line and you have no idea if it was true. If and you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it. <laughs> if you don't know easy. anything about something, don't say it. <laughs> right. And ask questions like we always say instead ask about mm -hmm. their symptoms ask about their oh, what are you going through what right what what is what do you have to do to, and instead of saying you need to change your diet you could say so do you use medication diet how do you do it like learn take it as an opportunity to learn and it's it's okay to ask those questions but not to tell somebody who is fighting this disease because they're the last person who wants to hear from you who does not have it. <laughs> and the other thing is we went to the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. It is always a great resource, guys. This is, you know, one of our favorite places. Uh, we, love our, we love our local chapter is fantastic. We work closely with them, but you're welcome to go on their website. And I had just looked up on there what they had on diet. And one of the things they have is the myth is that IBD is caused by foods you eat. That is a myth. The fact is IBD is not caused by what you eat. Although certain foods can make symptoms worse for patients, IBD is not caused by a specific food or diet. And then there's a link you can also click on to learn more about that. But that's something that's very important is that it's not caused by a specific food or or a diet. It's just awoken. Yeah. Flare. You wake yes. it up. Yeah. <laughs> you flare. You wake up the beast. Yeah. And we're working on something too over here. We have another project we're working on to help you guys. We're always trying to find ways to use our situation to help others. And, you know, in in ways we can because we're not doctors or scientists. No, so we try to find other ways to help out. And so we're coming up with a few things that can help with finding triggers and things like that. So that's yeah, in the works. That's something to look forward to. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, there is a, another thing from the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation that we found. It says, like, while researchers are working to understand more about how various foods, such as those that are ultra processed, like potato <laughs> chips, <laughs> sodas, candy, yeah. crackers, or have added sugars, emulsifiers, and other additives, may contribute to the underlying inflammation IBD. But there is currently no direct evidence to suggest that specific foods cause inflammation. There could be something that could change in the future when you're listening to this. Something interesting to think about. Scientists have figured out a bunch of different things, like electric cars, things like that. And they still don't know much about Crohn's disease. That just shows how new um, it is. Yeah. And it's growing fast. <laughs> yeah, it really is. There are soon certain foods that may lead to unpleasant symptoms, even if they're not causing inflammation. So maybe that's something important to differentiate. I think, listen, if you guys listening, it may lead to unpleasant symptoms, but not actual inflammation. But I think it could be confusing to you because you're like, is this a flare or is this something I ate? Yeah. And so I think that is confusing because we don't know enough about that. And depending on a symptom, maybe it's, obviously they don't know this yet. But a hypothesis, uh, maybe if a symptom is too bad or if a mm -hmm. symptom caused by food, that then directly cause a flare. If a symptom gets too bad, that symptom itself could maybe cause something that could cause a flare. Yeah. So the food doesn't cause a flare. The food causes a symptom. And that symptom that gets worse causes a flare. Right. So that, I mean, it's a good hypothesis. <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> All we need is the proof. Yeah. Paying attention to your diet may help you reduce symptoms. So maybe not inflammation, but symptoms. Many people may worry that they could have done something differently to avoid developing IBD, which is what people blame a lot of people for. But it says, remember, diet likely represents only a small piece of the puzzle. So kind of like we're saying, there's a big picture and there's multiple band-aids. And so all these little different band-aids are put on this disease because nobody really knows what causes it. Nobody knows how to cure it. So it's like you're, you just keep putting different band-aids on. And these different band-aids 
are going to be things like diet and biologics and other types of medications and treatments. And so, yeah, it's it's just it's a part of it. Diet is important because it plays a role, I think. But I think that was a really I, I really was interested when I read that one to include that for you guys. So hopefully you found that, you know, as exciting as I I, I found that interesting. It is right. I think it is. It, it helps explain it because sometimes we can just talk and I can babble and go on and on and I can talk in a circle and be like, I don't know if I'm getting this outright what I want to say. So I love when I find something where I'm like, oh, this is organized and written so well. And the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation does such a good job of Shout that. The Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. Yeah. <laughs> thank you guys, yes. because it's very helpful. And so I like to do this so I can show you guys listening that there are easy reads that you can find things that will explain things in a way that, hey, that makes sense. We're going to kind of close this out. Um, biologics are necessary. That's Definitely. yes. And dietary changes didn't make a difference. This is our situation, is right? This is for us. And you out there may have a very different experience and that's okay too. But just like we shouldn't say this is the only way to do it, make it's sure everyone. you're not saying that. But I think it's important to have healthy discussions, healthy conversation, help that's each other questions. out. It asks those questions and say, you know, if you are doing diet only, maybe there's questions I would love to ask you. And if you are curious about biologics, we would be happy to answer those because we can. I can't speak from something I haven't experienced. He can't speak from something he hasn't. And so we rely on his doctors for the treatment and they have not steered us wrong. They've done a great job. And if I felt like anything was not being done to his, to, to the best for Mason, we would have looked for a second opinion, but I definitely wouldn't go online and just change his treatment no. ever because somebody online said something worked or or a person I meet in passing. So just important to remember, consult with your doctors. And in our case too, uh, we tried to identify food triggers. We kept a food log. We tracked everything he ate, everything he drank. And it didn't really seem to make a difference. It didn't. So some of you out there though, it really will. And so I think it's important. I, I do want to say it is important to find those triggers, mm -hmm. monitor it. And sometimes things may change. If all of a sudden you're eating, you're not feeling well, maybe you have a new trigger food. And maybe, you know, we've had to do that even with Mason when he did flare we were trying to figure out, we wanted to look back and say, okay, what changed? Did he try something new that triggered something? And so it is important to continue to monitor diets, you know, to, to look for those triggers. But sometimes certain foods will affect you and sometimes they won't just like for anybody. And so I think at the end of the day, it's just important to consult with your doctors and to ask questions to each other and to not tell somebody to change their course of treatment because something worked for you. Offer that advice, offer your situation, but don't come down on them if they don't take that advice and if they don't change it because you, they're going to do what's best for them. And this disease is... That's why. It it's is. not their fault that it doesn't work for them. Yeah, it's important not to put the blame onto the patient and so hopefully with more research, continue you guys working hard with the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. The Take Steps, we'll be talking about that soon. That is starting. And so if you have a local chapter, we encourage you to reach out, join Take Steps, meet others out there with IBD and fundraise, raise money. Help support this. Yeah, so we can do research so we can find out if something is as simple as diet or if it's not or whatever. So we can just keep doing research and giving a life that to giving life to these people that they deserve and keeping them healthy and happy. So that's about it. So with that, um, I would like to say you can follow us on Instagram at team IB determined to watch our daily lives, things we do going to the hospital, health updates, Those things like that. Is... Um, the Reggie project. If yes. yeah, we launched that. So if you guys listening would like to have your picture and your story put onto the Reggie Project, just go to Instagram at the Reggie Project, give us a message, send us a picture, and we're more than happy to share that and spread awareness for any health challenges, not just IBD. Okay. So any, that's, anyone. yeah, that's the goal of this is to raise awareness for what you're passionate about or for, you know, what's, what's 
hurting you or a family member, speak out about that. And you can also listen to our podcast on any podcast stations like Spotify, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, or Apple Podcasts, or wherever it's played. And if you like watching it, make sure to go to YouTube. And if you are on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe. And if you want to be notified every time we post a video, make sure to hit that bell uh, bell icon. Yep. And, and we got, we've been getting comments. Yeah, we have, which is helpful and exciting. And we love hearing from you guys. And we're just going to keep doing this because this is, this is a labor of love. This is our time off. Um, Mason doesn't have school today yes. and I'm not working. So, but technically now we are working because yeah. we're doing this. So, oh, wow. yeah. So, what you know, twist. we, we do a lot of behind the scenes work. It's a full couple days of research and prep that go into these episodes. Mm -hmm. Then we do this and then we have to edit and put it up. So we really do this because we care. This is not something we make money from. It's just something that we want to provide that comfort and, and that, it. yeah, and help others out there and just be that, be that voice that we needed when Mason was diagnosed. So I, I hope you guys find value in that and keep listening. So, and also Mason's going, we'll be talking about this next week. Mason's doing a he, well mason's going to be on the news Ooh. most likely on tuesday yeah he's he's going to be working with the san diego blood bank and rady children's hospital to speak out on the need for blood donations so we'll be able to share more about that next week so stay tuned we'll we'll let you know how that goes yes so hopefully it's good donate your blood <laughs> So we're going to be working on that too. He gets to work on what he's going to speak about. And so I'm proud of him and I'm sure it'll go well. I have, I have confidence. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right, guys. Well, thank you for listening. Have a great day. We'll see you in the next video. Yep. See episode. you guys on the next episode and video to podcast. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Bye guys. Bye. We hope you will stick around, tune in and reach out to us with your own journeys. We are excited to give you an inside view of what it takes to be a caregiver and what it's like to be a patient. And most of all, we hope you'll maybe be able to play something you hear on here that might help you in your own life. Sometimes life changes and it's all about how you handle the journey.